Thanks everyone for coming to our departmental seminar today. I really appreciate your attendance as chair of the Communications and Events Committee. And I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Alex Flynn, who's joining us from the law school at UBC, where um, prior to her career as an academic, she was practicing law both in the Aboriginal law sector and corporate law sector. Um, and she's going to give us a wonderful presentation today, and we should have lots of time for questions. Um, so please keep some questions in mind. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks. It's really great to be here. Um, a couple of reasons why I'm so delighted to join you today. Uh, before I started up at UBC in the law faculty in January, I actually worked in a human geography program at the University of Toronto. And so I really do feel this you know, strong kinship uh, with geographers. And as I was looking at many of the bios online, I was you know, kind of nostalgic for my relationships with former colleagues that were doing such cool projects. Not that law, you know, legal scholars don't do interesting things, but, uh, but what you do is, is definitely way more, way more interesting. Um, and then the second is I actually uh, studied here at SFU back in the day, back before there was a university, uh, which tells you how old I am. Um, and it's, uh, it's lovely to be back uh, in this, you know, really, I don't know, kind of tantalizing concrete jungle that uh, <laughs> invokes all sorts of uh, interesting thoughts that you can only get from being fogged in maybe. <laughs> Um, so, and you know, of course, I'm really delighted to be here uh, in this territory of, um, of the Lower Mainland, this Coast Salish area, which is different from the one that I work on uh, at UBC. Um, so, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that we are on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, the Squamish, uh, Kikwitlam, sorry, Kikwitlam, which is a new First Nation for me, um, and the Tsleil Waututh uh, Nations. And the fact that we're on um, uh, Coast Salish territory is uh, very meaningful for the talk that I'm going to give today. Um, so this presentation is part of a larger scholarly project that I'm working on, which concerns uh, indigenous municipal legal relationships. So there's a whole bunch of boring background on why um, cities and indigenous communities have a different kind of legal relationship than indigenous and provincial and federal governments um, that I'm happy to talk about if, if you're interested uh, later. Um, but one, um, one interesting facet of this project that, uh, that I've started working on is in the area of parks um, and park management. So I started this project when I was still a faculty member at the University of Toronto. Um, and a first part of um, this study that I'm going to be presenting on had to do with a park in the Toronto area. So um, in Toronto, we don't have um, the same kind of legal landscape uh, when it comes to First Nations that we do here on the Lower Mainland. Um, but despite this, there's a very strong Indigenous presence in the city and a lot of activism, a lot of work, a lot, a lot elsewhere that's taking place. So a Métis scholar and I are looking at the management of a stretch of the Humber River, for those of you who know Toronto, um, which a number of indigenous peoples have kind of taken, taken stewardship over by planting traditional plants and hosting ceremonies. And they're doing this outside of a legal framework. There's no formal relationship that they have with the city of Toronto. And so uh, Doug Anderson, uh, my colleague and I, are asking what do the legal relationships look like from a settler perspective, but also from an indigenous perspective. So now that I'm here, in Vancouver, um, I'm thinking about parks and I'm thinking about the legal relationships between um, First Nations, which have a very different kind of uh, set of rights than we would see in Toronto, and especially um, Salmon Park. And I'm gonna tell you why this project is so interesting to me as we go through, but I think it's important just to preface this by saying that Stanley Park is like a crown jewel of the city of Vancouver. You know, if you look at uh, any kind of material on what makes Vancouver so special. The reality of Stanley Park seems to be, you know, kind of the cherry on the top of what is so fabulous about this city. It's, you know, it's natural beauty, the size, that it rivals uh, Central Park, for example, um, in terms of how, uh, how much there is to do in this area. Um, but what is rarely spoken about in the context of Stanley Park, 
is that it has a fraught legal history when it comes to the indigenous peoples that resided there uh, at the time that it was taken over by uh, European settlers. Um, and even throughout the time that it became uh, kind of uh, enmeshed in the legal relationship between what would become the city of Vancouver and the federal government. So the indigenous presence in this park is, uh, is long-standing, thousands of years old. Um, and that's part of why I was so intrigued to delve more deeply and to see what kind of synergies um, this park had with uh, the stretch of the Humber, also a very large urban park in the city of Toronto. Um, and just to situate, um, situate you in the kind of literature that I'm engaging with for this project, um, Basically, there's two debates that I'm trying to reconcile, two ideas that I'm trying to bring together. Um, the first is the land title of Indigenous peoples themselves. Um, so there's a, a number of cases that have made their way through the courts um, as a result of a section of the Constitution which was added in 1982. This is Section 35. And this section, um, in the way that it's played out in the courts, is, is basically trying to get at the bottom of, um, do we believe that Canada was this vacant territory, terra nullius, this, this stretch of land that whoever arrived at first could like, kind of like uh, the moon, could kind of plant a flag and therefore it became theirs. And if not, and the courts have said it, it wasn't that, that's not, the doctrine of discovery is not something that we accept. If it's not, then what does that mean when the land was never given away, it was never sold, it was never conquered, something called unceded territory, which is what is the reality here in the Lower Mainland. This land was never, uh, was never sold, there was no treaty over this land. There are treaties in many parts of Canada, but not this area. Um, so then, th then what? What do we do if we're trying to balance this idea that there is no terra nullius, there is no doctrine of discovery, alongside this idea that, okay, but the land was never sold or given away. How do we figure that out? And so a scholar named John Burroughs at the University of Victoria talks a lot about that in property law theory. Like how, how have the courts taken this, um, these two competing ideas and tried to make sense of them? And to John, there's really no reconciliation that they've been able to provide. So that's one strand of literature, one set of ideas that I'm engaging with in this project. The other has to do with how property frames space and articulates power, which maybe is more where you're the experts um, than I am, really. Um, but this part of the project is building on the work of your colleague, uh, Professor Bromley um, and uh, David Delaney, <coughs> Bruce Braverman, scholars who are trying to understand better how um, conceptions of property um, frame the space that ultimately um, ultimately is being uh, named or is being assigned a particular set of duties or characteristics um, or that kind of thing. Um, and of course, um, the idea of personhood is a, is a colonial, as I'm going to talk about in a moment, is a colonial concept that seeks to define what legal rights and obligations exist. But in my view, it's also a way to frame power relationships in the titling of space and the way that we call something. Personhood has the capacity to, um, in some ways, um, kind of undermine the objectives that it sets out. Um, and so this quote from John Page and Ann Brower uh, kind of gets at this idea of, of how property theory um, is trying to, um, uh, you know, set out a set of um, objective criteria that is supposed to remove it from the space itself. And in my conception, and, and maybe yours as well, that's, that, that can't be true. The way that we assign property titles has everything to do with the types of spaces that we're trying to create. So what I'm going to do in today's talk is I'm first going to go through the legal spaces of Stanley Park itself. What, what happened in this park? Um, next, I'm going to talk about property and personhood, um, what this means, what personhood um, um, does in terms of property. 
um, and what has happened in other jurisdictions. And then finally, I'm going to advance a theory of cautious personhood when it comes to Stanley Park, essentially arguing that we can't be too quick to assign new titles of property um, as a way of deciding what kinds of rights should be there without doing the hard work of actually engaging in the practices of, of relationship building and conversation. So I don't normally like to start off when I talk about spaces, I don't normally like to, to start off with the settler version of what took place, but I think it's important to um, kind of tell the very simple story of Stanley Park as it would be understood if you looked at Wikipedia and tried to get at, you know, you know what, who had rights over this, uh, this particular area. Um, so European settlers laid claim to Stanley Park in 1859 by declaring it to be a government reserve. Um, and at the time, it was seen as an ideal space for a military base uh, because of its location right on the water, that it would protect what would later become uh, the city of Vancouver. And over time, um, the you know before British Columbia formed part of uh, Canada itself, over time, this space was assigned to the government of Canada. And, uh, and this included uh, the Stanley Park Peninsula itself. Um, and for those of you who are more familiar with the uh, actual land, uh, the, the reality of the land itself, which is another fascinating area that I don't cover, um, it actually wasn't one big park to begin with. It was uh, at least two separate areas that were filled in to become what we would now understand to be Stanley Park. So this is a picture of the very first meeting of the city of Vancouver's city uh, council. Uh, so you can see very formal with the sign and the tent. But their very first uh, order of business in 1886 was to ask the Dominion government for uh, the, to convey title to this peninsula to the city of Vancouver. That was like number one on their list of things that had to happen. Uh, and that's what did happen. The federal government leased over to the city of Vancouver um, a long-term lease for control over this space, and over time it was perpetually renewed. Um, so it still is not technically owned by the city of Vancouver, but there's a long-term lease in favor of this city that's expected to kind of go on for some time. So that's kind of the law in the books. Uh, if you uh, can read any of Mariana Valverde's work, the law in the books, the, the formal story of what um, is understood uh, as Stanley Park. However, at the time that all of this was happening, this peninsula was inhabited by uh, many indigenous settlements. Um, and in particular, the Weiwei, which was a community that lived there, had approximately 12 settlements um, in what we now know as, as Stanley Park. Um, they lived there for many generations. They cultivated the land. Um, there's a number of, um, of uh, remains that have been located on these lands, many archeological sites. Um, and uh, um, as, they, as the spaces in the park were getting built, more and more um, archaeological sites were discovered. Um, in fact, the roadways themselves um, were uh, described by some um, indigenous peoples as, uh, as kind of an act of, of really, um, almost an act of violence of taking this space over uh, what would have been you know, settlements that were residing there. Um, so to the city of Vancouver, which had this long-term lease at the time, the inhabitants of this area were considered to be squatters. And so they were asked uh, not very kindly to leave. They were pushed out of, of these spaces. And those who didn't leave were sued for trespass. Um, so we have actually something that's quite rare, which is a body of jurisprudence, a body of case law, that describes um, the eviction of the squatters in these spaces. Um, and, uh, and these lawsuits um, basically alleged that uh, this was city of Vancouver land and the people who were residing on it were not permitted to do so under the laws, under the rules of the city of Vancouver and therefore um, had to leave. And so the law, in this sense, was a real instrument of, of removal. Um, on one hand, the claim of ownership over Stanley Park 
um, gave justification to the city to remove the sites, to claim the archaeological remains, which were sent to Canada and only returned to the Squamish Nation in 2006. Um, but in addition, the law was a tool to uh, evict, to give a trespass notice and to say that people were not permitted there. But there was, um, there were many families who did refuse to go and that was what spurred the legal cases that resulted. Um, and so the Cummings case, which I mentioned here from 1925, centered on this question of when did these communities come? And this will loop back to the literature that I spoke about at the beginning of the talk. Um, and so essentially the, case, the courts were divided on this question of could we believe the indigenous inhabitants when they said that they had been there prior to the uh, 1860s when the Dominion government had claimed uh, ownership over this space. And at the first level of court, the judges said, no, we can't believe them, they're too old, we can't trust their memories, they, they wouldn't know. Uh, but the Court of Appeal said, uh, actually, we can trust them, they're very credible. Um, and under the case law that has developed under common law, it makes perfect sense that um, we would be able to believe them based on the stories that they're providing and the evidence that they're portraying. Um, but when the case made it all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, um, the, the justices said, uh, no, we have to defer to the Superior Court. We're not actually going to say whether or not these were credible witnesses, but what we are going to say is that when a Superior Court makes a decision, and it seems reasonable, we have to trust what they're deciding. Um, and so a couple of comments on this case, uh, which is interesting to note. So the first is um, the whole question of deference to superior courts, which is actually not what the courts do. There are very few courts who are like, you know what, they made a good decision, we should just trust them. Not a usual kind of approach that, that courts are likely to make, especially not the Supreme Court of Canada. But what's more interesting for our purposes, for our discussion here today, is the fact that the court was able to bypass what is a very complicated uh, question, should they have uh, decided that, um, that the witnesses were credible? Because if they had decided that the witnesses were credible, they would have then had to ask, what do you do with a space of land that was never ceded? which was merely controlled. What would have happened in that case? And that was a question that never actually went to the courts until much later, until the Silcateen decision, um, which was in the last 10 years, um, which also concerned a British Columbia nation, the Silcateen, um, the Silcateen nation, who um, basically made that exact argument and were successful at the Supreme Court level. So the courts would have had to have grappled with this very difficult question quite early on in, the, in Canada's existence. So they were able to bypass that. And so what we know from that is that um, really the, the, the instrument of the law has been very complicit in a lot of different layers, not just in one way, not just by claiming the space, not even just by levying trespass notices, but it's been complicit in the strategic way that it's treated other kinds of court decisions or other kinds of arguments in order to avoid deeper questions of indigenous title, particularly on stretches of parkland. And I, I'm not gonna talk about that too much in this case, but I hope given the expertise in this room that we're able to talk more about parks as a legal space that is especially important for these kinds of debates. So the irony is that while all of these actions were playing out in the courts, there were a number of totem poles which were being uh, put up in what is now Stanley Park. And I'm sure many of you know that these totem poles don't originate from Coast Salish nations. Many of them are from Haida communities brought down because they were considered to be more beautiful. Um, and so while this park was being uh, displaced of its original inhabitants, it was also being marked in a way that was uh, completely inconsistent with the reality of who this space um, actually belonged to. Now, more recently, kind of moving up to the present, um, as uh, in my view, as the courts have had to start grappling with these difficult questions that they were avoiding in the 1920s, um, but also because of the extraordinary activism of indigenous communities all across uh, Turtle Island or North America, 
we're seeing much more confrontation, much more, I guess, reality checking on what do we do in spaces, in legal spaces, which we know don't um, rightfully, uh, that's a complicated word, which we can maybe unpack later as well, which don't rightfully belong to Canadian governments, whether they're federal, provincial, or municipal. What do we do about these spaces? Um, and so uh, as a response to this, the city of Vancouver had decided in 2014 that the city of Vancouver would be a reconciliation city. This was the first uh, city, to my knowledge, that created that title for itself. And that as part of these endeavors, it would do a colonial audit of Stanley Park to figure out how to move forward. So that's still playing out um, now. It has hired um, um, uh, Rina Sutor, who is uh, an indigenous planning expert to uh, help uh, with this colonial audit, as well as others who are you know, uh, consulting with um, the uh, Coast Salish nations. Um, and it's, it's you know, trying to sort of think about how to move forward on these questions. And in um, kind of a first report that was given out, um, what was written, I think, is very meaningful for this question of personhood or indigenous law or the way in which we cities, the way in which cities and settler nations are able to have these conversations and move forward in addressing colonialism is the fact that under indigenous law, and in particular the indigenous laws uh, of the Coast Salish people, what we think of as property, what we think of as ownership, is not, is not the same as what these nations may conceptualize it as, or may not be. We don't, we don't quite know yet because um, we haven't maybe asked that difficult set of questions about how do we not just reconcile this question of ownership, but how do we reconcile the fact that there's different ideas of property to begin with that might apply to this park space as a whole? Um, and so for the purposes of our talk, where that becomes really meaningful is in the question of species, in the question of uh, water, in the questions of soil, um, and other kinds of uh, features of property which may have their own legal rights or own um, attributions that wouldn't make sense in our Western conceptions of property. So just as an example, there are some indigenous nations that see the water as being just as much of an actor, that there would be a treaty that we would have with water, um, and that the water is just as much of an actor as a human would be. Um, and that is completely um, consistent with their laws. Um, just as uh, much as in the Western notion of property, we would have categories of law like a lease or fee simple title or what have you, just as much as we take for granted those conceptions of property, so too in some nations would uh, the legal rights of uh, animals, not just animals as a category, but specific animals with whom there would be very particular kind of relationships that would exist. So what this begs the question of is, what then does that mean for Stanley Park in moving forward? And one idea that's been put forward is that personhood might be a way of reconciling these different worldviews, these different property worldviews, um, because if Stanley Park is considered to be a person, not the land of the city of Vancouver, not under the jurisdiction of the park, Parks Board, but also not the land of the Coast Salish people. If it has its own legal status, then maybe that's a way of moving forward. Um, so this idea of personhood is something that is gaining much more traction um, globally, um, especially when it comes to nature. So whether it's parks or rivers um, or otherwise, um, that perhaps this is a way to um, reconcile situations across the world like are the ones that we see playing out in Stanley Park, where you have a colonial government that has laid claim uh, to a space, but at the same time there's a very strong uh, indigenous set of rights that apply. Um, and so, you know, in some ways this is not a particularly new debate from, a, from an intellectual perspective. Um, so back in 1972, um, Professor Christopher Stone uh, in the United States 
thought up this idea of personhood as a way to protect, protect nature, um, that this would be a good way of moving forward. And that's uh, important, that this was uh, a way of protecting nature. Uh, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. But what I, but I want to add is that there's a number of scholars who have since, including uh, Professor Boyd at UBC, who have spoken about nature as inherently having some rights, that we need to recognize that, and that personhood might be the vehicle, the legal instrument that can be used um, to make it so. So, so what is personhood? What does that actually mean? Um, so in Western legal sy systems, um, all beings, all human beings, are recognized as being persons. So that means that we have particular rights, all of us. Uh, all, all human beings have rights to which we are protected. And uh, in some cases, um, there are non-human entities that have been granted personhood as well. So for example, a corporation, a university, um, a trust, a municipality, these are all legal fictions. You know, they all are, have the capacity as a person, but that's because the law has said that they have those rights. They don't have the same rights as you and I do, these, these legal fictions. It really depends what the text of the legislation says are their particular rights. But they are called persons so, to, so as to enable them to enter into contracts, um, and various other legal technicalities. And in addition, um, there are legal responsibilities that we all have as persons, as, as human beings. So for example, if we have children, we have obligations to those children um, that we can hold because we are human beings. Um, and these are all things that are set out in the law, whether it's in the text of a piece of legislation or it's through the courts and what the courts have decided. Um, and then the other kind of interesting facet of personhood is say, for example, I don't have capacity to make a particular set of decisions. Somebody can step in and make decisions on my behalf. Um, so as a person, I have the right for somebody, if I don't have the ability myself, for somebody else to step in and protect my interests. So that's, of course, really interesting when we get to the question of nature, right? Because na you know, natural a park or a river might not have the capacity, probably doesn't have the capacity to speak for itself in a language that we may, maybe some of you can understand it, I unfortunately can't, but um, that we would understand, but we would then have the ability if a park was a, a person to step in and protect it. There would be some way of, uh, of you know, actualizing those legal rights. But there's also a lot of ways that personhood uh, needs to be uh, disentangled. So uh, this might sound a little bit um, confusing, but just because something is called a person doesn't mean that it has the same set of rights as a human being does. And so the devil's kind of in the details about what personhood actually grants until we dig into the specifics of what particular legal rights have been conveyed. The other important piece to remark on in the context of personhood is that it doesn't take us away from the colonial system. So this is very much a Western concept. And it, even if we, uh, even if this is, uh, as I'll get to as in an example, even this is, if, if this is a tool that an indigenous community decides is the right way to move forward for a particular set of rights that they may have, it doesn't mean that we're extricating ourselves from the Western legal system. That's still where the concept of personhood resides. And then the other third important factor about personhood is that it doesn't necessarily grant resources or economic rights. Um, so it grants legal rights, and that's meaningful, um, but it doesn't grant other kinds of rights, like raising revenue, protecting particular resources, it might not grant, um, in the case of a river, the same kind of rights over the riverbed or air rights, which are what happens within a particular area above the land itself. It may not grant any rights or protection for animals who are nearby or for fish that are within the stream. So it's, uh, 
it, you know, it can be a, a label that's attributed to a particular um, area or structure or thing that we think we know, but that doesn't mean that it extends to every aspect of the forms of persons that could theoretically reside in that space. So the reason that personhood became something, uh, at least in property, nerdy property law circles, as something to pay attention to, was because of a decades-long uh, legal negotiation that took place in Te Uumera in New Zealand. Um, so the New Zealand, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with New Zealand. Uh, okay. Yeah, awesome. Uh, yeah, so they have a very different uh, legal model when it comes to uh, the rights of the Maori and the, the uh, treaty of uh, the treaty that protects the Maori in New Zealand is very different from anything that we have here in Canada and so some legal scholars believe that that's in part what enabled uh, the personhood for Te Uha to exist. So this is uh, what was formerly a national park that the iwi or the indigenous communities had been fighting for more protection for. It wasn't even a claim, like a, uh, a desire to own it. It was to protect it from rampant tourism that was taking place and negatively affecting this particular space. Um, and uh, the, over time, after a series of negotiations, um, the, uh, the uh, New Zealand government um, agreed to pass a particular statute that was based on the Tuhe, the community that lived within this area, uh, their stories of what kind of protection should be given to this space. And so it was not a um, assigned uh, category of legal rights, personhood in this case. It was, uh, it was a long uh, negotiated settlement that best protected this particular area. And the other important um, facet, two important things uh, that are also um, kind of crucial in thinking about this large park in New Zealand was that it carried with it a plan, a resource plan, that was actually very beautiful. If you ever have a chance to read it, I would highly recommend it. Um, it's one of those things that for those of you who teach uh, anything related to this, it's something you can like, read out loud in classes and it's unlike a lot of policy papers, not, not to judge policy, but, uh, or law, which is always boring. Uh, this is actually like a, a really gripping um, plan that sets out the respect that uh, this park is owed and, and why and, and its history and, you know, it, it, I mean, if you're ever a doubter on personhood, this kind of makes the case for why it's meaningful. Um, but this plan was developed, again, over many, many years. So it, it wasn't just this assigning personhood, it was establishing the details of what it would mean to have this label attached. What would that mean in terms of conservation, in terms of tourism? What would this mean in terms of the other species that resided in this area? And then second, what the plan uh, supported was the governance model that was going to exist as well. So do you remember how I talked about um, how with personhood, like if I was incapacitated, somebody could step in and protect my legal rights? Well, it's the same for this park. Um, so the governance model sets out who gets to make decisions for it. Um, and what I think is the most meaningful part of this plan is that the governance is largely uh, is, is largely Maui run. So it isn't uh, if there's a there's one uh, representative from each of the governments that is assigned, but then there's also a steward who is from the Maui uh, community who um, is able to give advice on what this park. Uh, should have what its um, what its um, protection should be, um, and so it's that governance model, in my view, that is as meaningful or more meaningful than the uh, assignment of a term like personhood. So, as for any of those who are you know kind of policy people in the room, the 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 creation of personhood for this park 
um, has found its, it's traveled its way around the world to Colombia, to Ecuador, to India, um, where different rivers and waterways have been recognized as being persons as well. And, you know, I have this um, chart, which is part of a bigger uh, description of the specifics of um, what personhood means in each of these jurisdictions, which I'm very happy for any fellow nerds that want to look at it, very happy to pass it along. But what's really meaningful to take away is that they're very different from one another. So the way in which personhood became understood differs depending on the jurisdiction itself. Sometimes it was through negotiation, like for example, the Te Awa Tupua River in New Zealand, again, was the result of a negotiation. But in the other jurisdictions, it was not. It was part of a court case that was enabled because of the text of the constitution, which permitted the river uh, being granted personhood status by the courts. And that is a different kind of legal recognition than when it's negotiated. Um, and part of the reason why it is different, in my view, is because it means that the governance of these spaces is going to look different as well. So in some cases, the governance hasn't been uh, entirely worked out. Like, for example, in Colombia, it's not really sure going forward who will be able to make decisions for this river and how binding they'll be, or if they aren't followed, what the dispute resolution mechanisms will be. Um, it isn't clear what the river wants or how we would know that, as it would be in the case of New Zealand where this resource plan sets out in far more elaborate detail what, what the park wants, what its, what its rights as a person should, should seem like. And then uh, in addition, the other important factor that differentiates these from one another are the um, uh, other species that reside nearby and to what extent are they also included in uh, having legal protection. And so um, based on the fact that personhood can look really different depending on the way that it's created, depending on the governance that's going to be established, or the factors that, that are comprised of this entity that now has this, this set of rights, in my view, in coming back to Stanley Park or any other Canadian municipal jurisdiction, which is like all really that I know about, uh, we need to be very cautious in assuming that personhood is the way forward for the protection of this particular legal space. So part of the reason that we need to be very cautious is that the rights of nature are not necessarily the rights that the indigenous communities in question would want to see happen. So there's a big body of case law that talks about the sui generis, the unique nature of indigenous rights in Canada. That means that they're not like anything else. It's a kind of a recognition that we have this colonial legal system and there's a different set of legal rights that Indigenous peoples and communities have. Um, so the sui generis title is, is meant to remind us that uh, we're talking about something outside of what our Western knowledge would tell us. Um, so the courts have recognized that quite clearly since uh, 1982 when Section 35 of the Constitution was enacted. But what does that mean? Okay, great, they're unique, but what does that mean? Well, in a case called Vanderpeet, the court said, we have a proactive obligation to figure out what exactly are the uh, indigenous laws in question. So it's not just a matter of saying like they're their own thing, like they're different. We actually, so decision makers, need to figure out what those indigenous laws are. And moreover, we need to be able to distinguish amongst indigenous communities. We have hundreds, 500 plus indigenous communities in uh, Canada. We have uh, so many different levels of band governments versus traditional governments versus regional um, alliances that to say that there's a pan-indigenous notion of what uh, personhood could mean or what land stewardship would mean um, is not in keeping with the case law that has been developed. 
And so when we think about something like personhood, we need to be reminded that that isn't necessarily consistent with the legal orders of the nations in question. Um, and in particular, um, the fact that we do have a different set of legal norms and that there are different kinds of relationships that may exist within a space um, can make personhood pretty complicated. Uh, because how do we, like coming back to Stanley Park, how do we assign personhood status to the park without acknowledging what the implications are going to be for the other species or aspects of nature that might reside within. Is that in keeping with indigenous laws? Is that in keeping with what would be the knowledges around, um, around the rights that, sh if that's the way they're gonna be con conceptualized, that should exist within that space? And moreover, in Stanley Park, there's at least three nations that have uh, an interest in this area. There's other nations as well that, that that have claims to Stanley Park or have asserted claims to Stanley Park. And so there might be um, conflicts between the laws of each of these nations. So coming back to legal personhood, um, there, there, the idea that personhood is consistent with indigenous law or every indigenous law is something that makes us, I think, cautious about it um, from the outset. In addition, um, I think there's uh, a bit of a desire um, to make things right, which is good. You know, we do want to make things right. We do know many people, I think, are waking up to the idea that there has been a huge injustice in Canada around the way Indigenous peoples have been treated uh, with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report um, by the City of Vancouver and other governments acknowledging um, uh, reconciliation as an objective that deserves uh, real attention. Uh, the British Columbia government having endorsed the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I think we're we're awakening to the fact um, that this is something that you know needs to be addressed in a really meaningful way. I have two kids, and the the way in which they're able to uh, understand and acknowledge. Um, the, the violence that has been committed to Indigenous people is really different, I think, certainly than my generation. Even though I grew up in Nunavut, you know, you would think that the, I'm a white person who grew up in Nunavut, and you think that there would be a deeper uh, acceptance of, um, you know, of the violence of what law has done. And, I, you know, but I think it's, it's hard. It's hard to understand what to do. It's hard to know how to move forward in a good way, in a respectful way. But that doesn't mean that that rush to make things better is the urge that we should be uh, adhering to. Um, so, so Eve Tuck um, and uh, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name. Uh, oh, Wayne Yang speak about the uh, you know the kind of settler move to innocence. We want to make it right. We want to fix it. And I think personhood can be that kind of move to innocence, right? Like, well, if we assign personhood, then we're, it's not yours, it's not mine, but it's, you know, or it's, you know, it's not anybody, it's not the cities, it's not the indigenous communities, but it's kind of, we're all working together and it's gonna move forward in a good way. And I think there's a resistance that we need to invoke uh, and acknowledge and invoke when it comes to not wanting to do the really hard work that happened, for example, in New Zealand around Te Uga, Umera. I'm sorry if I'm very bad at pronouncing it. Um, the hard work that that meant that they could arrive at that place that worked, maybe has worked, I hope has worked, in that particular legal space. Um, and that that's really where we need to sit with. We need to acknowledge really in a honest and deep way um, exactly what leaders within the Coast Salish territories are saying about this uh, audit, this colonial audit that's taking place, which is that it's it has to come with honesty and it has to come with more than just wayfinding and you know the right art commissioned by people who actually have some presence there. There there needs to be an openness to 
to sitting with the discomfort and, and a genuine desire to move forward in a way that might be different from what we expect. Um, I think there are some good examples of the way in which um, that discomfort can be understood. Um, so the Indigenous Circle of Elders uses the term ethical space to describe the space of, of work. And I think that's something that would be really helpful in this situation. So it's um, the ethical space is um, not a desire to have an answer. It's a desire to sit and to talk and to communicate in a way that is completely um, detached from how uh, decision making can be understood. So not a, a mandate with a, an agenda. I mean, they can have a mandate, they can have an agenda, but it's a it's a willingness to to sit and talk and hear and listen and you know and that's. I think the kind of spaces that um, certainly uh, some of the um, folks that I have spoken to about uh, the City of Toronto's context, um, the park space that is there, have said is really helpful. So uh, uh, it, as part of that project with, with my uh, colleague Doug, we've sat in ceremony um, on the land for days. You know, to try to kind of think through what what is the way forward? What are the questions we should be asking? What the participants that should be there? Um, that may or may not work here. This is a different a different place with different nations and and all of that. But I think this idea of the ethical space as being something that's not driven by a particular agenda and a particular time frame is something that could be very helpful in thinking through the next stages. So this is a picture of Stanley Park that I think um, kind of sums up the, the interrogation that is underway that we're all, I think, going to be part of. We are all living here uh, as this, these questions get sorted out, which is, um, you know, the rock and the army base, you know, right here. This is the this is the question. What do we do with this space? To what extent are we able to dismantle um, settler notions of law in creating a new kind of legal framework that works uh, here in this park? So that's it. Very happy to take all questions. Tell me if you think I'm wrong. You know, there's no paper yet, so um, you know, all thoughts will be very much appreciated. Or if you want to talk about case law, that's good too. Yeah. Enjoyed it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in uh, the ways in which different types of models, governance models, and other types move around from place to place. So I was interested in what you were saying about the way the Western New Zealand model yeah. uh, gets circulated to other places. Yeah. Could you talk a bit about how that happened? Like, were there particular actors involved that transferred those ideas? To, like, how much you got into it a little bit about like, yeah. the fact that they then change when you come into new places? But could you talk a bit about the, the networks through which they moved? Yeah, I mean, actually, it's interesting. I have a, a couple of colleague friends who are in Colombia and uh, in Toronto who are, and myself who are focusing exactly on that question. Um, I guess the uh, disappointing news for you is that it wasn't really a policy transfer. You know, it was a, it was a legal judgment transfer, if anything. Um, the policy transfer is applicable within New Zealand, I think. So the way in which the river and the park are governed is different. I mean, they're different parts of the country. And um, I think that's the more salient question for your purposes. Unless you wanted to think about how courts play a role in policy creation, which is really what happened in India, in Ecuador, and in um, Colombia. Because there it was very much the courts who were, and probably in part because of the, the relative newness of the Constitution. Um, that we're able to read in 
through the text of the Constitution, this idea that had been created through policy elsewhere. Um, that's the part that we're interested in that we haven't sadly moved forward on in, in uh, any good way yet. Um, but if it's just on the policy side, I would, I would stay there. What I would say though is that, and I, and I alluded to this in the talk, the court's articulation, the order of the court's articulation has not lent itself to things like a uh, plan for what this will mean in those spaces. And so the courts are ultimately the decision makers. So there's already been legal disputes that have gone back to the courts for reconciliation, as opposed to um, having a, a governance body that is able to uh, have a mandate to answer those questions. Um, and I, I don't know if that's very helpful no, to no, you, but we'll keep in touch about it because- It's interesting um, how, in a sense, courts are quite innovative. Yeah. In the way that we say can stop block. Yeah. It seems when we were saying they we want to be read in and move through. Yeah. And in some ways, the courts, which is why I haven't totally given up on law altogether, but you know, courts can be a really good catalyst for change, right? I mean, it is, and I don't want to poo-poo the actions of these courts in saying that these spaces are deserving of legal protection, um, and that this might be an instrument that it was thought up by a human. You know, obviously a lawyer was arguing in favor of this. Um, so it's not necessarily that it's coming from a, a completely outside any form of indigenous thought or any form of activism. It's just that it's in and of itself, it's not enough. And so what do we need to do? If I were you, if I were you who was interested in this question, if I was, you know, whatever, in your job, I might be asking what else needs to happen here uh, in order for that to be realized? Like what else could courts mandate, for example? Governments to do and which governments. And, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the, I, the way that um, that I've seen like personhood and property come together, like previously, is is that um, is like how um, how like the inability to own property um, can can feel like a challenge to personhood. Um, and I'm thinking about, thinking about like personhood and these spaces and um, how, how like Stanley Park, how would, how would it work for Stanley Park to own something? Um, right. And um, I guess I'm wondering if, if you see, if you see this like concept, like, do you see, do you see like the application of, of personhood to natural spaces? Do you see that? Um, do you see that like reframing local personhood, or is it just an application of the concept? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, not that yours wasn't a great question. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's um, so the so the park is a person, so it can theoretically own other things. You know, just like you're a person and you can own a house. It would be the, the analogy, I guess, would be like the house owning itself, but it could also maybe acquire title to something else. So it's the it's a real decentering of the human, right? And um, what that means is um, is going to depend on the way in which that legal right of personhood is constructed. So, for example, a corporation is a legal person. But it doesn't have every single right that a human would have, or every single obligation. It's going to depend on what the Corporations Act of a particular jurisdiction sets out, or its this long, boring act that sets out what it's allowed to do. And so for Stanley Park, if it did become a person, it would depend on the piece of policy or the bylaw that set out what exactly it was able to do. It seems unlikely to me that that would ever mean that it could own something. Uh, it's more likely that it would be this way of um, optically making it seem like something different and giving it another governance model than the one that's currently in place, which is that the Parks Commission would have responsibility for it. So I think it's um, it would be a different kind of person. Does that answer your question? Sort of? Not really? Yeah, because 
Yeah. I'm just wondering with regard to Stony Park, to what extent um, and this, uh, this involves some uh, facts that I'm not quite clear about myself, but to what extent some of the uh, activities within the park are already are, you know, actions or contracts that one would associate with personhood, like the different concessions and lessees right up from the aquarium to the gift shop to the, yeah. the various um, tourism-oriented facilities, which, as I understand um, um, from taking a look at the, the um, reconciliation plan and, and the audit, are really a, a problem for the yes. park because they are a different management style. But nonetheless, I, and I don't know, so I don't know whether these businesses are contracted with the park or with the park board or exactly what the legal relationship is. Can you, can you say anything about that? I don't remember to whom there's an agreement, yeah. but I will say that it does, it does lead to a hierarchy of rights yeah. because these, um, these concession rights or like, for example, the croquet club or, I mean, this, they're, they're more than the sum of their parts, right? They're not just a place for people to go and play croquet. These are institutions that are part of the mystique of Stanley Park, part of what made this area such a precious place for, for um, um, you know, people that came from Europe, mm -hmm. European settlers. These were like, um, these were very meaningful for them. And the legal relationships that protect them uh, are strong and robust and, and normatively robust. And so in, that's, I think, part of what um, is so crucial about taking the time or having the ethical space to really think about what those kinds of relationships are going to mean alongside the history of, of displacement of the park like to whom does this park belong you know anyone who spent any time there probably may feel a sense of belonging to that space because it's it is so striking and so beautiful and so uh so much a part of what makes Vancouver claim to be the most beautiful city in the world and to wrestle with that beauty alongside uh what happened there who was displaced and how, in what ways, and how to how to move forward and reconcile is very complicated. So I think um, you know the legal relationships are, in some ways, easier to figure out because there's enough examples of competing legal claims and how courts are going to recognize that. I think what's more complicated are the are are the people who to whom those contracts belong, thinking about their relationship to the park in a different way, or alongside the rights of other people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have lots of questions, but I think I'll limit myself to just one. Um, I, first, thanks for your very interesting talk. I have a kind of technical question. I'm always a little bit here. I think that one. Um, but, which is, do, like, does the crown retain its underlying title, yeah. even if Stanley Park becomes a person? Yeah. Okay. So the crown would still, even if, so best case scenario, Stanley Park becomes a legal person and its government's model that's set up is that it's First Nations driven. That's right. But if the crown felt that the they were deciding something that was not in the public interest, the crown could still yeah. intervene. And, that's uh, the way. So there's like a lot of different ways it could be structured. I mean, the, the federal government could say, you know what, we're going to pass the act. We're going to pass the Stanley, what would be called Stanley, the, right. you know, whatever was going to be called the Hoi Hoi Act or whatever was going to become, depending on what was appropriate, um, what was agreed to. But it seems more likely that it would be um, a decision to change the governance structure of the Parks Board. Yeah. That's the that's, most, that's very interesting. I yeah. That's the main thing I've gotten from your talk is like the, the Declaration of Legal Personhood from what I mean, got from you, more than anything, it just creates an opening to rejig yeah. the governance structure. That's right. 
Yeah. Yeah. In fact, the governance, uh, not just because that's my passion, but I think the governance part of it is the most interesting part, right? Like, and that's where co-management agreements or even management agreements become much more of a helpful guide in saying, or, or like what's playing out in the District of North Vancouver with this Lay Tooth Nation, like how, what kind of uh, governance rights are handed over to the First Nation as opposed to the municipality retaining them. One thing that's really interesting, just to contribute to that point, is that the city of Vancouver has has agreed that when there is crown land, so these are lands that are owned by the province or the federal government, but more likely in the city of Vancouver to be the province, that First Nations get the for right of, oh, it's not really a right of first refusal, but they get the right to buy the land first. And so that's why parks become super interesting because they're, they're crown land, right? They're not, there's no, aside from your complicating point, there's not other interests that are at play. And so um, it's another piece on all of the various activities, whether it's the new development under the Burrard Bridge or the lands, the Jericho lands, this other piece of land that is going to have its, potentially have its own kind of maybe ownership, maybe legal status, maybe governance model that is going to change the landscape of decision making. Piecemeal though, so like jurisdictionally fashioned. Yeah, and you're like the whole premise is that it was all stolen, and mm -hmm. we're just like, oh, we made this person, and you can have control of that, and oh, this land's coming up for sale. Oh, you know, like it's it just all seems so inadequate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, yeah. have something related to what you said. I see the two kinds of person in general. Like, society, one that are in charge of themselves and people that are not in charge of themselves, they can be babies or kids or they're grown up or mentally insane, things like this. So when I'm saying what you're saying is that it's not really a person, it's a person that other people are responsible for making decisions. Yeah. So, but this is basically the animal or person. It's, it's, that's what, I think that's exactly right. That's why we have to be so wary of this as a, as a normatively uh, robust legal category. That it's, it's, it's actually, it's not what it appears. Maybe I should change the title, you know, like an apparition or something. I don't know. It's, it's, it's not doing what it claims to be doing. It can do what it claims to be doing, but it doesn't necessarily have to. Um, personhood is what we make of it in law. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe the city of Vancouver through this colonial audit is going to just give the lands back. It seems unlikely. So, you know, kind of invoking the, the pragmatic ideas about what might happen alongside the very complicated and um, really a legally outrageous past of this park you know, it seems unlikely that it's going to, the federal government is going to step in and do anything to such a material extent that it'll remove it from being this very qualified person, if that happens. Yeah, it seems also that it's kind of placing like the stewardship or the governance of Stanley Park into the hands of the indigenous population. But with the decisions and choices already made by the southern population, so it's like, yeah, you can control it now, but these decisions have already been made. Like the things that are here, the aquarium being here, whatever's here, right. that's there. So you can now watch over it, but it's kind of already things have already been decided. And so it seems it seems like symbolic, but it doesn't seem like it it really means a lot. I don't know about it. Yeah. Yes. I know. I sometimes I don't want to be like like usually such a relentless optimist, but on this one I'm sort of like, mm -hmm. I don't know what what's really going to come of this because there's there there are there are so many things that are manicured in that park mm -hmm. and created in the park and you know how do you undo tw like 100 years of even more you know 100 plus years of development that's taking place and other obligations and other um, i mean i think in some ways the humber example that i've been working on with Doug is so much clearer because there's 
there's very it's a very secluded area that you probably wouldn't even know of unless you knew that it was there you know and the city has no interest in it i mean they were able to in like the folks that were um planting traditional plants and conducting ceremony were able to do it quite obscured for years and years and years um i mean there's it's a that's also fascinating because there's more recently been a lot more friction in a good way i think with the city but there it's not like stanley like stanley park is so like so built up mm -hmm. that what would it there are things that there's the future right yeah. there's the revenue there's the ecosystem there's like all sorts of things that are meaningful and i wouldn't ever want to understate that mm -hmm. but yeah it's it's got to be qualified just kind of enveloped in the identity of the suburb city at this yeah city, right so so giving so giving this kind of like modified governance structure how much does it actually do? And I, I worry about, I mean, personhood already, and we were talking about the way that it relates to people with mental disabilities or homeless populations, there's kind of like um, conservatorship, there's this kind of um, warping of what's in their best interest. Yes. You know, and so I, I, I wonder about the way that that would play, could come into effect as well. Yeah. I mean, this is where um, the colleagues that I was mentioning, um, you know, we, I think all of us were really, and one, one of them is Sarah Van Wagner. She lived in New Zealand for a number of years and did a lot of work. She does a lot of work with uh, other Maori professors and community members. Um, you know, and I think initially there was this kind of enthusiasm over this legal category, like for boring property law nerds, like personhood is really sexy and, woo, you know, like breaks us out of this box and wow. But when you dig in the, in the weeds a bit, it actually can undermine it to such an extent that it that it almost violates the resolution that was made in New Zealand, where it was done through extraordinary Maori activism. Like, and that's the part that I worry about from the settler state that will, like me, I mean, become attracted to these categories because they seem in and of themselves to have emancipatory potential mm -hmm. but um you know but we can strip it down right it, in fact personhood is prone to being stripped down it's mm -hmm. like it's like which is so funny because you think you know personhood like, what's better than that but it can it, it has the capacity in the way that it's constructed to be almost removed of every element that would give it the power about power, basically. Oh, sorry. Would you mind if I, Claire, do you mind if I take your question? Okay. My question was kind of uh, like similar to what you were asking earlier, too. I'm just thinking about, um, like, it does just take us beyond sort of typical sort of conservationist notions of parks, this idea of personhood. And is it, like, just sort of troubling even how we can take up personhood within this sort of, like, seller colonial property frameworks? Um, and how can we even confidently say that um, indigenous personhood is like fully realized mm -hmm. under these current structures right. that we have? So are we almost like skipping over yeah. indigenous personhood by going towards like the personhood of this part? So we like we're, and again like I think it was really valuable what you were saying about you know how can we even assure that indigenous notions of land are embedded in what's being envisioned for these parks? Um, so it's sort of like think about moving beyond recognition and are we actually talking about the repatriation yeah. of land? Are we actually talking about yeah. the repatriation of land? What what would that look like? Um, and this whole notion of the crowns land, I'm from the US, so this is like kind of blowing my mind a little bit. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Like, like, oh, like, yeah. Is it gonna come out? Like, yeah. <laughs> um, but just the idea that, that that an indigenous nation would have to pay for that land. Yeah. Like that is <laughs> yeah. It's true. And it's also, I mean, I, when I practiced Aboriginal law, I was here, um, and so all my clients were um, First Nations, and um, big range, right? Like, big nations like Squamish, and much more uh, economically vulnerable communities like the Ahadasat, like a huge, huge range. And you, you really can't assume that, I could not assume, nobody can assume that the the norms that we think of are going to apply to one community are going to apply to the other. So there are First Nations that have a very strong desire to have fee simple land, which is like the highest form of ownership that you can have under the Canadian model, um, and to develop it, to build 
condos or malls or whatever, whatever they want to build, gas stations, whatever, and may or may not have uh, what we would, or some people, I shouldn't say we, but what some people would, I, I mean we when I say white settlers basically, uh, would characterize as a sustainable uh, desire. You know, I mean, there's a lot of, I think, judgment too that can come into question on what Indigenous people should think about the environment or about sustainability. And, you know, for many nations, there's sort of like basic survival, you know, where uh, having economic development on the lands that they have any interest in, you know, may not have a lot of potential either. Or, you know, there's there's just like, like everywhere, there's just a huge breadth of interests and uh, interests and realities that are going to play out in decision making. And what is clear is that as long as the decisions are retained by the Canadian state in whatever jurisdictional muddling we we set up, we're not we're there is a tacit undermining of indigenous capacity to make those decisions. Um, and a belief that somehow whoever, fill in the blanks, is better able to decide what those interests should be. And, um, and, and I think what's even more problematic with something like personhood is that it can justify that framework um, while still kind of believing that it's not you know, it's like, but we love Stanley Park and we just want it to be maintained and, you know, we want the fish to be healthy, you know, so we'll have personhood and then, you know, we'll, the city will think about whatever governance model makes sense instead of saying like, you know what, just, it's co legally complicated and it's, it's messy and it's, we totally, like the Canadian government and the city has totally screwed it up, but just pass it on. And, and that's something that is, is not easy for even just to mentally get your get heads around what that means when it comes to uh, when it comes to power. Sorry, that was a very circuitous way of responding to your thoughts, but it's yeah, very. I think it's the heart of the whole issue. Do you have another? This might be a bit repetitive, but I I liked what the Te Uru case is like as very fraught and um, especially. Recently, because I know that the mineral rights are like still the problems, yes. and so, um, and so there was like this this like presentation that I saw about that and how how the personhood of the river has made it like difficult to to like um so basically like the the quote that I'm remembering is that there was like a Maori person who said that um that like Maori people just understand like arguing that like that is fair is um is like arguing to own another person and yeah yeah I'm, I'm just thinking about that and yeah yeah, there was this quote, which I'm going to get wrong, but just paraphrasing around the time that Te Ehuera Act was enacted, which is that the the land is me and I am the land. Like it's it's a it's a the world view that ultimately led to that legal framework for that land is so outside the concept of ownership, right? Like, and property theorists, especially legal ones, you like, geographers are always better at everything, but um, we kind of forget, I think, that ownership is not actually, it doesn't have to be so tightly woven in with property in the way that it's been constructed. It's one version, one idea of what property can mean, the idea of ownership. Um, just like other categorizations that have, you know, have been, you know, kind of advanced, like common property or the urban commons or all of these conceptualizations. Um, I mean, it's all a social construct, right? So we can dismantle ownership from land and we can dismantle the, the legal fiction. We can think of something better, you know, collectively, I think, if there is this space to do it, than uh, stripping down the personhood. I guess is the ultimate thing that I think. Like, we should trust more 
the Coast Salish nations, and even ourselves, even the, like the city of Vancouver, indigenous and non-indigenous people who reside there, to think through what other kinds of legal categories would work better than, than that one. The question about your um, the work that you were doing in, in Toronto, um, which is really interesting to, to hear about. Uh, I'm wondering if the new or relatively new um, Rouge na the, Rouge na the Rouge National the yeah. National Park yeah. on the borders of the city that was put together as a kind of assembly of some existing parks and I guess additional land had to be I don't know whether it was bought or if it was already Crown land in order to turn it into this um, supposedly ex subway accessible <laughs> national Something, park. Yeah. But, but I'm just, I was curious about in that instance if you knew anything about um, consultation with Indigenous peoples in that, in the formation of that particular park, which is so far yeah. as an urban national park, yeah. a unique creation. Yeah, so interestingly, um, because it's a federal park and most of the lands were federal, the federal government does have a, have a duty to consult and um, to consult and accommodate First Nations who have interests in a way that municipalities don't, which is this large present, this larger project that I'm working on is really about that, that problem. Um, and so they, they would have had the obligation to consult and accommodate. Um, I remember looking it up and finding very little on any consultation that happened or the results of any consultation or, or what have you. Um, so the, it's a relatively, it doesn't seem that long ago, but it was like 10 years ago. So the law around what consultation looks like and the activism around um, what should be happening as a result was different. So I don't think it was, I don't recall that it was a meaningful part of the process in creating it. But that's also pretty noteworthy. Yeah. All right, well, <laughs> well, we could say that. I guess this is me pulling the plug, but um, I just really wanted to thank you so much for such an informative presentation. Um, I think a lot of us gained a lot of you insight and probably will never think of Stanley Park in the same way. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Glenn, for coming. <laughs>